feeding children and realizing that so many of them are often so confused about subject choices and it's a very genuine concern to have. Um, but it's amazing how IB has so many options to offer and how they can actually basket through all these options and, you know, like use their interests and use their strengths and, you know, build a profile, uh, such a holistic profile. And there's so much to IB that I feel a lot of people don't know. So I'm really hoping that, uh, you know, they can make sound choices and they can get into IB more confident uh, and really embrace because this journey is a tough one, but make it slightly easier if they have the right choices. Okay. Yeah. And just to add to that, I actually think that IBDP is like the perfect curriculum for like college. It really prepares you uh, in a breadth of different areas. And like Ruchi said, there's, there's a lot of misconceptions, confusion about, you know, which subjects to choose, especially because I think the main concern is like, how will they align with my future career? You know, like, okay, let's say I want to study law. I want to study business. What subject should I be taking? Am I supposed to take math, you know, AI or AA? What level am I supposed to be taking? There's so many questions. So we're hoping that today we're able to answer some of those. Um, and we'll have a Q&A, uh, you know, session uh, towards the end as well. So if in case any of our attendees have specific questions, we'll be happy to answer them. Fantastic. That's always good to hear. I think one of the things most people worry about sometimes is what is are, are, what are the big mistakes really in choosing? And I guess just uh, I don't want to give any of the webinar away, of course, but can you just give us an example of what's one of the biggest mistakes or biggest concerns, like just anecdotally that you've seen come at you? I think out of personal experience, a lot of students um, think that because they've done well, in IGCSC, that it's going to be the same at IB. And um, that's not necessarily the case, especially when it comes to tougher subjects like the math. Uh, and also, there are a lot of misconceptions of how, uh, you know, the sciences give you a wider option as compared to humanities. Again, that's a very uh, big misconception there. How you can actually ban a science with a humanities is a great thing and how you can actually get into liberal arts because of that. Uh, so there are, uh, I think, primarily math being one of them is something that I would like to touch upon and uh, in this, and I hope there are some good questions coming up. Thanks, Ruchi. And Pfizer, what's something that you, you've seen as well that's, that, you, that has just really worried you before when kids have come to you about these subject choices? I think one thing that, you know, also comes across is that um, they feel like the journey is kind of set in stone. And once I select, you know, certain subjects, I'm not going to be able to pursue a certain major. And I just think there's so much flexibility uh, when it comes to choosing college majors and careers. And of course, if you're looking at certain professional courses like medicine or engineering, yes, then there may be like specific subject requirements. But Apart from that, like really the world is your oyster and there's a lot that you can study, especially if you're going to the US. So as important as your subject choices are in relation to your college major, it's like nothing set in stone, you know, and that's also what I like to tell students that don't feel like at the age of 16, you're deciding what the rest of your life is going to look like, because there's still a lot more room for exploration. Fantastic. Thank you so much, folks. Thank you for joining us. We're just making sure that everyone had the time to jump in. Uh, but I think we have that opportunity now. So uh, Faiz and Ruchi are going to get us going. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and uh, they'll take it away from here. You don't want to listen to my boring voice the entire time. So uh, I'll see you in a little bit, but uh, probably around the Q&A section. Take care. Thank you, Ethan, for the lovely introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone, for joining on time. And um, it's it's lovely to see you all here. Um, so yeah, I'm really excited to, um, uh, for you to hear and, and for us to dig into um, choosing the right IV DP job subjects for you. Um, and again, uh, this webinar is designed for IB students uh, who are facing the dilemma of choosing the subject. So hopefully by the end of this uh, webinar, you'll get a, a guidance and an idea of how to choose your subject 
uh, subjects wisely and at the same time uh, with passion um, because you will stick in, in, in the IB for two years, uh, hopefully not more. Um, so yeah, <laughs> you'll need to carefully choose your subjects. And um, if you've got any questions, uh, please feel free to type your questions in the chat. Um, and uh, we'll be happily, more than happy to answer uh, your questions. And before we start tonight, uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, speakers for today, um, Faiza and Ruchi. And before we dig into any um, more details and topics, uh, we'd like to hear more about your background uh, with IB. Um, so we can start with the Ruchi and then Faiza, and then we can start our uh, presentations. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Kiro. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Ruchi Steven and uh, I'm also a business uh, management examiner with the IBDB. I've been teaching IB for the last eight years now, uh, but I've been teaching business for over 14 years and I really believe that IB is one of the most wholesome uh, curriculums that I've ever come across. I am slightly biased towards my subject, but no, I mean, no one's going to push you to do business. Don't worry, that's not the agenda, but um, it's it's a really interesting wholesome curriculum and I'm so glad that you know it gives you these various options and it allows you to explore uh, so many different areas and gets you better prepared for university. So I'm really looking forward to having this discussion with you all. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ruchi. And hi, everyone. It's nice to meet you. My name is Faiza, and I work as the head of college counseling at Ascend Now. Uh, I'm an LSC graduate, so I have a background in political science and development studies. Um, and I've been working with students for over six years on their college admissions journey and helping students figure out what to study, where to study, and how to navigate uh, the entire admissions process. And I'm also an international ACAC member. So that's actually one of the largest and most prestigious uh, associations for college counselors, admissions officers, and independent educational consultants. So I'm a member there as well. And yeah, I'm really excited to just share a little bit more about how you know your subject choices can align with certain college majors. Uh, and help you arrive at, you know, the best decisions for you. Um, so what I will do is we prepared a little presentation for you. So I'll just share my screen and we'll, Ruchi will be starting. She'll be sharing a little bit more about the IBDP, uh, the curriculum and how it's structured. And then I'll be talking about how it links with your college major. Uh, so Hello, can you hear me? Okay, great. Okay, so let me just start off with what the IBDP is all about. And, uh, you know, when you would think of the word IBDP for any student or any teacher, this is the logo that everyone knows by heart. You know, this is IB in its concentric circle, but it's beautiful because if you look at it, I just want to start from, we go from in to out. And if you look at it, the heart of IB, it's the learner profile, which is why it is such a beautiful, wholesome curriculum. Because while they want to impart, you know, a lot of theoretical knowledge and all of that, the heart of IB is to see uh, independent learners, you know. And if you look at the IB learner profile, it just adds so much to who you are as a person, uh, which is why it's a rigorous curriculum, not just academically, but it challenges you on a personal front as well. And, uh, you know, I've often seen students joining, you know, the first year of IB and saying, I'm a changed person by the end of the curriculum. And not just in terms of academics, but I think the rigor and the push and the challenges uh, makes you, you know, uh, discover so much about you. And I think that's the beauty of this curriculum. Uh, moving on to the next thing, there's something called approaches to teaching and learning. Uh, which is how they want you to not just approach academics as a way of like a top chop method, but uh, different ways of uh, you know imbibing that knowledge, which of course has a lot to do with the teacher and the student, but that's the more uh, the, the second circle. The third part is called the DP code. So if you look at it, it's the TOK, EE, and CAT. Let me just give you all the phone forms. TOK is theory of knowledge. It's it's basically 
why do you do what do you do give me answers for everything you know and uh, and it's in, it's interesting because you know this generation the gen z wants an answer for everything and so tok is all about let's go back and find out why is what who said this why did they say this how does this matter how does it apply so it's constantly questioning understanding uh, why certain things are done the way they are done so that's a little bit of tok which is theory of knowledge the ee stands for extended essay and uh, this is a good 4,000 word research that you would be doing in any one of your subjects. I will come to that a little more when we understand a little bit about the higher level and the standard level. But the extended essay is one subject that you pick from the any of the six subjects that you've opted for. Generally, it's at a higher level and uh, we encourage students to take an extended essay in a subject that you would likely want to pursue because it sets your base for research in that. Uh, and then you have CAS, which stands for Creativity Activity Service. Uh, like I said, the heart of IB is not just seeing academically sound children, but a holistic uh, individual. And so CAS is about giving back to society, uh, looking at your strengths and weaknesses and seeing what you can do with that to, you know, grow as an individual and really challenge yourself. Uh, let me also tell you that the, the overall IB uh, is scored out of 45. And, uh, but TOK and E together is for three points. Uh, and the other subjects are for 42. I will come to the breakup a little later, but just to give you the DP code, CAS has no points. However, you do have to make a CAS portfolio at the end of the two years. Uh, but TOK and E together, there is a grid that can explain how you need to score those three points out of 45 to get that full score. Then we move on to the next part, which is the languages. So uh, in the next slide, I'm going to go into detail, but that is your next big 42 points that come from there. The maximum that you can score in a subject is seven. So seven things are 42. You have six subjects that you opt for. And... Uh, Again, the beauty of IB is that it's divided into internal assessments and exams, which we call external. Internal assessments can vary between 20 to 30% of your entire weightage. So that's that's a good amount which you can maximize on. That's you know totally under your control. Uh, you know, your teachers are looking into it, the school is there to support you, get the help from whatever you can, however you can to maximize on that 20 to 30 percent that can just take your grades uh, you know a notch up and then you have the external exams which are taken twice a year either you have the may series or the november series again depending on your school policies uh so that's our ib in a nutshell and you know, we're just going to get into the main part now which is what are these six groups basically about so let's start off okay so the first one is basically English, okay? Uh, it's language and literature, but there are, um, there's English language and literature, there's English language. The most popular one, which I believe is 90 to 95% of what most schools offer globally is language of English, language and literature. Uh, that's the first group. Uh, all the first five groups are compulsory. You cannot like drop English at the IB. Uh, just on a college counseling front, uh, if you are an English HL student, uh, English language and literature HL students, a lot of universities, uh, uh, you know, they excuse you on the IELTS and you don't have to give that exam if you are an IB English HL candidate. And I'm sure Faiza will also, you know, probably highlight on that. But that's the advantage of taking an English at an HL, again, if it's your strength. The next one is language acquisition, which is nothing but foreign languages. Again, the top three famous languages are uh, Spanish, French, and the third one now picking up is German, and then Mandarin is uh, becoming popular, but French and uh, Spanish are very, very popular amongst language acquisitions. Uh, please understand that there are two parts in language acquisition that I would like to highlight. One is called the adding issue, which is when you take up a language that you haven't learned at all, then it's brand new to you. So you're basically learning the A, B, C, D, like as little like the basics. Or you do something called French BSL, which is HL or SL, whatever you want to take it at a higher level or standard level. 
but that is if you had some foundations of the language beforehand. If not, then we opt for a level called the ab initio. Again, the ab initio is very scoring, of course, because it's the basic and uh, Spanish and French being extremely scoring subjects. The third group uh, is individuals and societies. And if I have to put it in one easy word, it's all your humanities. All your humanities from business. I'm starting with business, my favorite, sorry. But business, you have economics, you have history, you have psychology, another popular subject, a very famous upcoming subject, global politics, you have geography. Now, these are the six most popular subjects, uh, subjects in the humanities. Um, you have to opt for every group. So now this is where there's another subject called environmental studies. It's called ESS, Envi Environmental Systems and Societies, which is the subject that falls under group three and group four. I'm going to explain a little more about it. And this is primarily uh, for students who want to pursue science, right? Like if you, you're sure you want to do like an, you know, you're doing a physics and a chem and a bio. You wouldn't want to do a business because it just doesn't interest you or it's, you know, it's not under your radar for pursuing anything to do with humanities. So IB has offered a subject called environmental systems and societies, which is like an ESS kind of a thing that falls under group three and group four so that a comma student can opt for it as a science or a science student can opt for it as a science. So it falls under both. So that's a little bit on uh, individuals and societies. The fourth is your sciences, which are basically all your, uh, you have your physics, chemistry, bio. You also have your computer science that falls under the sciences as well. Uh, again, another very popular subject. And like I said, environmental studies will fall under the sciences again. So in case you're somebody who wants to pursue commerce, so you can have uh, economic psychology, and then you can opt for an environmental studies in group club, right? Uh, so the, that's a little bit on the sciences. Uh, math is uh, recently in the last couple of years broken up into two approaches. One is called the AA uh, approaches. And uh, the next one is called AI, which is for analysis and interpretation. The major difference is AA is more towards the engineering math. It's the more the theoretical math. Whereas the AI is more statistical. It is the more uh, implemented math in that sense. So it goes well with economics or with the business. Whereas the AA fits very well with like a physics, uh, right? So again, depending on what you want to pursue, the AA, of course, is tougher uh, than the AI. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the a, the math AA FL is believed to be one of the most toughest subjects in all of IB. But again, uh, if you know if we are clear about this is what you want to do, it's I've seen several students score a super seven in it. It just depends on how it fits in with your other subject choices. And that's your math. So math AA and math AI analysis and interpretations. And uh, the arts is the only group that the IB offers as an optional subject, an optional group. You don't have to opt for group six. However. The group six is very interesting. It's for, uh, you know, children who are driven, clear, passionate about maybe it could offer visual art. You could have drama. You could have theater. You could have media studies. All of these would fall under the arts. It's, um, again, a very uh, intense curriculum. It's very, very demanding. However, uh, I, you know, just to throw some light here that there are students who you know, that I know who've taken a visual art and scored a seven and in all their other subjects have probably been under three or four, but then they've gone into some of the best universities in the world because they are, their art portfolio was so rich. So be mindful when you're opting for art because it's very time consuming. It's demanding in that friend, but that you're passionate about it. So you won't feel it, but it will, it, it kind of, of course, has its impact on the other subjects. Uh, but it's, it, you know, you're driven, passionate about something to do with art. It's great because, you know, you're setting your foundations early, as early as, you know, you're a 17 year old. So that's great. So that's an overview of the six subjects at the IB. And I'm sure there'll be several questions which we will address in the Q&A. Uh, but we'll move on to the next slide just for you to understand 
Now, does this work? In those six subjects, we need to offer three at the higher level and three at the standard level. Now, what is the difference? Uh, the higher level is like it's on the it's mentioned on the slide. There's a lot more content. It's a lot more extensive. Now, it's not like the SL is easier. Okay, it's just that it's lesser content. So, if you look at a textbook, yeah. we might have. 24 chapters covered in both HL and SL, but HL will have an extra five or, a, you know, extra six chapters, but the first 24 kind of remain the same. So just to add a little more depth and rigor, the HL is a more extensive course. Also in terms of assessment, you could have extra papers. Uh, so HL students will probably have like a paper three or something like that. And it is definitely more time consuming because the rigor is, uh, mode. How does it work in terms of college? Uh, again, if you know what you want to do, you would obviously want to take an HL in a subject that you would like you're likely to pursue. Uh, but coming back to how FISA started, it's perfectly fine if you've taken it at a standard level and still want to pursue it. There's nothing written in stone on stone, right? So it's it's everything can be worked on. But if you're sure of something and please do pursue it at a higher level. In fact, do your extended essay in it as well, because then you've created your base for university really well. Uh, so that's a little bit about higher and standard level. Um, some real big misconceptions. Are all HL subjects um, equally challenging? Uh, again, it's person to person. I've personally felt that uh, I've seen students struggle most commonly with the math, AA, but at the same time, there are students who excelled in math and got uh, a seven. So it comes down to how you are able to manage the time. Uh, but all subjects, uh, please don't be under the misconception that, oh, it's so easy to score in this HL. It's nothing like that. Uh, IB requires you to work in a certain manner. And all the subjects are designed in a way that you will have to give them equal attention. Uh, but I'll be honest, math will require more. <laughs> anyway. Uh, are SL subjects less valuable? Not at all. They are still very challenging. Like I said, 80% of the content will be pretty much the same, whether it's HL or SL. HL will just have a few more chapters added. Uh, and of course, the assessment is a little more rigorous when it comes to HL. So again, don't think that, oh, it's SL and I don't have to, it's easy and I can. I don't have to pay too much attention. Again, you know, you will mess that up for yourself. So ensure that SLs are given equal time and attention. Are HL subjects always better? Generally, I would say, you know, you take an HL because you are more inclined to it, number one, you know. So you have a automatic tendency to perform better in your HLs because you love those subjects. However, but it is dense. Uh, it is uh, time consuming. So uh, it's not always like HL subjects are better. You have to work at it. Nothing in IB is going to come on a platter. Everything has to be worked for. Subject choices alone determine college admission. Uh, I will leave that FISA to answer and there will be a lot of questions. But if that's a misconception, again, uh, I, colleges are looking at your entire profile, right? They're not just looking at what are the six subjects you've scored in. They're looking at who you are as a person and what value are you bringing in to their university. And the subjects just support that uh, in your profile. Uh, but these are a few very common misconceptions and I hope I was able to address some of them. But I'm sure when we have the Q&A, uh, we'll have better clarity. Yes. Thank you. Over to you, Faiza. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruchi. I feel like I also learned so much <laughs> more about the IBDP after hearing you speak. Uh, but yeah, this is actually the perfect segue into our next uh, section, which is, you know, the link between uh, IBDP subject choices and your college admissions and college major. So yeah, like, like I had said, I think earlier at the beginning of the webinar as well, we were just doing a little informal chat. And I said that a lot of the times, uh, sometimes students feel like, okay, once my subjects have been decided for grade 11 and 12, that's it. Like, I'm I'm bound to this now. I have to study this. Um, I would like to say that when it comes to admissions in the US, there's a lot more flexibility when it comes to changing your major. 
um i personally had a student who uh went into college uh, as a computer science major and graduated with a degree in art history two completely different things right so it just goes to show that yes you can select certain subjects in grade 11 and 12 for your ibdp but you're not constrained by those choices unless of course if you're looking at certain professional degrees so yes the main thing i wanted to say is that admissions officers definitely appreciate students who challenge themselves academically right they want to see that now you've moved from grade 9 and 10 possibly from a different curriculum to a different board altogether right they want to see that you are someone who likes to challenge themselves who wants to learn new things um and you know is is committed to that rigor that they're looking for so sometimes a lot of the times people think that when it comes to languages uh let me just continue with the french b because i know french you know i'll i'll score well but sometimes colleges look at it really favorably if you study a new language like okay i'm going to take bahasa indonesia because i've not studied it before but from a college point of view they look at it as wow in grade 11 you're starting something completely new and challenging yourself so you know that's one thing to keep in mind that the colleges aren't just going to be looking at your eventual grades but they are going to be looking at that selection as well did i make choices that showed that i was willing to challenge myself right so that's one thing that they're going to be looking at however they're also looking for a well rounded profile so that means choose some of the subjects that are your strength that you know you like that you will do well in and are connected to your major but also balance that out with maybe a couple of new things you know so we're looking at depth in a specific area but we're also looking at breadth across subject areas this is why i said the ibdp is the perfect curriculum if you're looking at applying for university in the united states um because there is no running away from the breadth of the subject areas you have to do all the groups you know apart from visual art like ruchi said you have to take like you know one subject in each of those groups so just by design you are forced to um uh, engage in depth as well as breadth right so the main thing is we want you to balance your subject choices in a way that shows that you have different interests but you also have a certain specialization so the connection between subject choices and let's say future like your college major or your career goals so in the uk australia europe you know they they may be a bit more um specific about the requirements like if you want to study um you know economics you should have math at hl for example but in the us uh, colleges generally are not as strict about specific subject choices or combinations of course except for certain like pre professional courses or degrees for example if you want to study medicine and you're applying for a pre med degree they will expect you to have studied physics chemistry and biology right because you're not going to be able to handle the intellectual rigors of the course unless you have these foundations in place in grade 11 and 12 but apart from certain exceptions generally there are no strict rules about your subject choices or combination that's also because in the us they have a liberal arts program or curriculum which means that a lot of the times even if you have declared your major like let's say i'm applying for physics i got into university for physics in my first year of college i am still required to complete certain credits in uh, a language certain credits in english research writing certain credits in something else yes your ibdp subjects do allow you to fulfill a lot of credit requirements especially your hl subjects but that being said you may still have certain basic requirements as part of a liberal arts program that you have to complete which is why the us is generally not that strict about your specific choices that being said ibdp students can still use their subject selection as an opportunity to strengthen their application by choosing subjects 
that are related to your college major because once you've engaged you know with that related subject you like ruchi said like if you know you want to apply for physics the best thing to do is to do your extended essay in physics because it really demonstrates that i am interested in this subject i've engaged with it in an academic capacity i've developed research skills and therefore you're a good fit for that major so it is encouraged that while there are no specific strict rules you can use this as an opportunity to specialize in the subjects if you're sure about what you want to study once you're at college so over here we've just got examples of some preferred or you know recommended subject combinations for specific majors a lot of them like you'll see do come across as a bit more obvious than others if you're going to be applying as an engineering major yes definitely taking math physics and chemistry is going to be beneficial for you same thing with you know business it's great to take business management economics math um same for economics uh, but there are some other uh, you know uh, combinations as well for example when you're studying architecture it is very important for you to take visual arts as well as physics uh visual arts because you're going to have to submit a portfolio as part of your architecture uh, applications and if you have taken visual art in school that portfolio process becomes that much easier and physics because some people think just math is enough but actually it's very beneficial to have physics to the point where some colleges may actually have it as a requirement again it can depend from course to course college to college but this is what is recommended for psychology again you can apply to study psychology at college without even having a, done it in the ibdp you know there's no requirement but of course having studied it makes a stronger application combining with it with biology is a really good subject combination so these are just some examples and we have a couple of more examples here which are a bit more like career related so for example if you are looking at journalism you have a dream to kind of work in the media industry so langlet of course taking it at hl will be really good but try to combine that with something else like if your school offers media studies you know take that or you can take history right because that's going to be very beneficial uh, in the future um a lot of the times people don't realize but taking ess uh if you want to study hospitality is actually a great combination because these days there's a huge emphasis on let's say sustainable travel and sustainable tourism so it can really add to your to your knowledge base right so with law as well you can't study law uh, you know as part of the ibdp uh, to the point where you know you don't even study law at college when you're in the states you end up doing a jd after your undergraduate degree but it's very beneficial to study english uh, literature at hl because law is going to involve a lot of in depth reading writing and research so these are just again it's not set in stone these are just recommendations of uh, combinations that work really well for certain majors and certain careers i'd also like to share with you some real life examples of students of ours who got into very uh, highly ranked and prestigious universities and what subjects they chose so we have a student who was accepted to carnegie mellon for engineering uh, he hadn't decided which engineering he wanted to specialize in so he went for a general or undeclared engineering major but these are his subject choices so he did go for the typical physics math and chemistry at hl but if you look at his sl he chose history because he had a genuine interest in it and it made his application so much more interesting right he wasn't just that one dimensional stem student but he also had an interest in history so that showed again that he has a breadth of interest and he wants to challenge himself in something that may not necessarily be related to his eventual career path then we have another student who applied uh to uc berkeley for psychology and this was the combination i'm i was talking about earlier which was that psychology and biology at hl was a great combination um 
because uh, there's actually a lot of interconnections between those subjects. And taking mathematics AI was also very helpful because a lot of students don't realize when you're studying psychology, you have to do learn how to do a lot of data analysis. There's a lot of statistics. There's a lot of assessments, uh, which is where the math AI can be really beneficial. Uh, then we have one more student who uh, chose to do theater. So this is again circling back to what Ruchi said. If you're very sure that you want to pursue a career related to the arts, that is when you should be taking a subject from group six. And so our student did take theater at HL and combined it with psychology and English, which was a fabulous combination because through psychology, they were actually able to get a lot of insights into human behavior, which helped our student in their theater performance. So again, that was a really good combination. And we have another student who applied to Stanford for international relations. Uh, so they studied global politics, economics, and math at HL and supplemented that with biology and uh, English literature and Spanish. So again, a really good combination because the student also had a specific uh, interest within international relations in, you know, Latin American relations. So having that Spanish language was actually really beneficial because within IR, they had a specific regional um, uh, like a region that they were really interested in, which they supplemented with their language. So these are just some, uh, you know, uh, examples. And we have a lot more examples, which I'll, I'll be happy to share with you later. Uh, but I just wanted to open up the floor to questions. I know we do have some questions coming up uh, as well. Uh, so, Kiro, if you'd like to just walk us through maybe the order of the questions, then Ruchi and I will be happy to answer them. Uh, thank you, guys, and Ruchi. I mean, how wonderful that was. Pretty informative, pretty rich. Um, and at the same time, I mean, I wish if I uh, would just... Um, an IB student, I would watch this webinar on repeat so that I could choose my subjects wisely. Um, and definitely, folks, we're having this webinar recorded for you to uh, watch as many times as possible till you get confident. I know this content is pretty rich and shouldn't just uh, be watched for one time, but I mean multiple times so that you get a clear info and insight of everything. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm pretty interested to start with the Q&A. We've got many questions here. Um, all right, so uh, as I'm reading, um, <laughs> there is a funny question that uh, one says, I hate math. Uh, let's start with that. <laughs> but why IB doesn't allow me to take only humanities subjects? So obviously, um, um, this student hates math. Um, I mean, I'm sorry for that. Uh, and the question is, why IB doesn't allow me to take only humanities uh, subjects? Okay, I'll answer that. Um, okay. I understand you, number one, to start with, because uh, I understand that there are a lot of students who don't like math, and it's a genuine, uh, it's a genuine feeling. Uh, but that being said, because IB is holistic, that's why they have versions of math that you can take that can further support your study in humanities which is why a math AI uh, is an interpretation math. So when you're doing an economics, it will help the math that you study kind of supports that and, you know, enhances that study. And uh, you don't have to opt for a math that is crazy, like your calculus. And even I'm making that face because it'll be probably really tough for me as well. And I'm a business teacher, which is why the math AI, even though you hate it, but because you like humanities, you'll see how it supports it. And, you will enjoy that in the way the curriculum is designed. But that being said, uh, math always, for some people, it's it's a concern. But look at it from the point of view of how it's supporting humanities, and maybe that will help you. But um, sorry, IB doesn't spare math. And in a way, it's good because I feel math is just a life skill. You just have to, you just need it. You just need it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd love to add to that. I was one of those students where I, I used to do really well in math till like junior school. And then once I reached senior school, I just I stopped doing well and I didn't like it. And I just wanted to drop it. But you know, the thing is, math follows you wherever you go. 
it it just is one of those subjects. So I was a humanities student, but even in my geography uh, class, I needed math because I needed to calculate mean, mode, median when I was doing my geography, like, you know, practicals. So even in geography, I needed math. Even in psychology, I needed math. You know, you get to college, even in my master's, I did my master's in development studies, I needed math because I needed to uh, interpret like different data and statistics. So the, you know, the reality is as much as we may not like it, math is going to follow you wherever you go. But like Ruchi said, the AI math is the one that's going to be very beneficial for humanities. So if you can look at it from that perspective, like even once you get to college, inevitably somewhere or the other, you're going to need to use math. So don't push yourself to take AA. If you're not going for engineering, you're not going for STEM, you don't need it. But think of AI as being something that's genuinely going to be beneficial for you. So if you can look at it from that perspective, that it's it's actually useful for you, then you know you may not hate it as much. Thank you, Faiz and Ruchi. Uh, perhaps if I would add, um, so I believe you can also think of ways to make your experience better with math. So perhaps uh, you hate math because of uh, an old experience with an old school teacher. Um, so I mean, let's just, just think of ways to make the experience a little better. So you don't just hate it and feel bitterness and resentment whenever you study. Um, I'm not saying that you should love it all the way, but perhaps like try to think of ways to make your experience better with uh, with math. All right, let's jump into the um, next question that says, why TOK is only one question? Uh, the TOK actually, there are six titles that the IB gives you and uh, you don't have time to, you don't, you don't want to do all the six, to be honest. It's good to do just one and uh, you can opt for a title that uh, appeals to you, excites you and uh, look into some approaches to learning and uh, areas of knowing and uh, that kind of, it's easier. I mean, it's actually good that you have to do just one question, to be honest. You wouldn't want to do more of the okay. Yes, definitely it is. <laughs> Thank you, Ruchi. Um, right, another question says, how many um, maximum HL uh, I can take? Um, we we'll also share these slides uh, and and informational booklet with with you folks so that uh, you can read um, because I remember this question was answered in in, in the presentation but again uh, Ruchi or uh, Faiza if you'd like to share how many HL uh, subjects um, should I take? All right, so the IB requires you to take three at the higher level and three at the standard level. That's the regular uh, requirement. However, there are very special cases, which are called the non-regular diplomas. Uh, if you are sure that you want to do four HLs, but that doesn't fall under a regular diploma category. So be sure of that. There are students who do that when they want to pursue medicine or where they need a physics, chemistry, bio, and math. An exceptional case, but IB has made an arrangement for that. But all that is required from you actually is the higher levels and three standard levels. And that's, that's the requirement. Yes, exactly. All right. Actually, I just would uh, like to just yeah. throw a little light on this. Uh, there is something called the IB Diploma, which is what we do. And there is something called the IB Certificate. In the IB Certificate, uh, you, there is no requirement of HLSS. This, you can do as little as two subjects as well. It could be both standard level. But if you are looking at the Diploma program in particular, which is what you what most of us do, it's three HLs and three SLs. Right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Ruchi, so much. Um, so, yeah, this question is for uh, is for Faiza. Um, it says, universities sometimes look at the difficulty of AP courses and take that in mind for GPA. Do they do the same for uh, IB? So, so, just to understand, like, when universities are looking at your academic transcript, they will look at your HL level subjects and SL subjects differently. So sometimes there is a misconception that, you know, getting a six um, or getting a seven in SL is much better than getting a six in HL because the grade is higher. 
but universities are also cognizant of the fact that the HL is more demanding and it's more rigorous. So they do contextualize your grades. So they will see your HL grades in context of the you know academic rigor and your SL grades accordingly. So that's what we do with like the advanced placement as well, right? You look at the grades in the context of the difficulty or the rigor of that course. So yes, they do do the same with the IBDP. That being said though, when they do look at minimum requirements uh, for like minimum entry requirements or recommended grades, for example, if you're looking at a Ivy League University, it's almost understood that you should have at least uh, overall 40 in your IBDP. So over there, they're just going to, they are looking at your overall grade, right? So they will say, okay, well, you should have at least a minimum 35, 38, 39, 40, depending on the college. So over there, they just give you like a blanket kind of grade. But when they are looking at your transcript, they are going to see each grade in context to whether it was HL or SL and what subject it was. Yes, exactly. And uh, I also wanted to highlight a point that uh, we've mentioned and Faiza mentioned that uh, grades are important. However, uh, you have your profile, something that you can control more and um and your essays as well so i mean yes don't just put all your effort in, in in grades i mean yes they are important however uh there are other important factors to focus on uh as well uh thank you uh Faiza, for uh, answering um okay um We've got here a couple of other questions. Uh, however, I'm going to skim through them pretty much quickly because uh, we're wrapping and we're um, out of time. However, I would like to uh, to have this session as informative as possible. So I'll do my best to go through all the questions. Um, the question here is for Ruchi, does IBDP put me in a better position than AP or A-levels? That's a tough question, to be honest. Uh, I'm biased towards the curriculum, so I'll definitely say yes. Uh, also because um, unlike the other, other curriculums, this one has an internal and external component, which no other curriculum has. Uh, the other com uh, curriculums, uh, to the best of my knowledge, are more theoretical. Uh, uh, it's more theory dense, whereas the IB, I feel, has a lot more emphasis on the practical application of the subject, which is why perhaps they have the... Um, uh, you know, the division of the internal and the external. Um, it is definitely more rigorous and time consuming again, which is why when we're looking at university applications, we know that when a kid is coming from IB, he's better prepared uh, as simple as research skills, right? So, um, and going back to the first slide that I started with, the IB learner profile gets you definitely better prepared for university as compared to other curriculums. Um, I don't want to get this message uh, wrongly across, but if you are doing the other curriculum, great. It just depends again on how you build your profile overall, and uh, you know the as an individual how you how best prepared you are to take on a course. But as far as curriculum is concerned, it is definitely the most rigorous that I've taught, and uh, from what I've heard from children, <laughs> yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yes, and I also wanted to add that it's okay if you didn't enter IB. I mean, IB doesn't suit everyone, and it's not for everyone. Uh, and that's why there are options as AP and A levels. Um, and I mean, uh, you have to assess yourself whether you're up to that challenge or not. Uh, however, it doesn't put you in in uh, personally. I mean, it won't put you in a really really uh, low position compared to other students, because you still have other factors as your profile and your resume and your uh, essays that will also determine um, who you are. Thank you. Uh, sorry, if I could yes. just add, like I just, like like Kiru was saying, it doesn't put you at like a disadvantage if you're not doing the IPDP, because even the AP and A levels, they have opportunities for you to demonstrate that rigor. For example, uh, as, as part of the A levels, you can do an EPQ, which is an independent project, which is kind of similar to your extended essay, right? And with the AP as well, you can take like AT seminar, which teaches you research skills. So even if you're not doing the IBDP, like I would still encourage you to try to extract as much as you can out of these other curriculums and push yourself as much as you can. 
right? So that you can demonstrate the same level of rigor. Yes. Um, adding into that, um, so um, as I've just mentioned that IB doesn't suit everyone, the next question that follows would be, all right, so what skills do I need to ace IB DP? Time management. Ruchi, are you going to say the same thing? Time. Yeah, we should have said it together. Yeah. <laughs> Let's say it together. One, two, three. Time management. Time management. <laughs> Bingo. All right. Bingo, yeah. <laughs> yes. Are there any other um, skills, um, soft skills perhaps, other than uh, time management? Do I need to really be I super smart? I think it smart? goes back to the learner profile, Kiro. Um, I think there's a lot that's like you need to learn to be balanced, a critical thinker, a problem solver, which I think the way the curriculum is designed, you it just imparts those skills to you, uh, you know, in ways that you're not even intentionally learning, but you're learning. So it's just come with an open mind, just come prepared that it's going to be the next two years are going to be exciting, challenging, and I want to learn and grow. And I think if you come with that mindset, you'll imbibe the skills. Yes. I second that. All right. Um, we're pretty much running out of questions, uh, but we still have uh, more to go. Uh, the next one follows, says that uh, is the SAT favored by uh, SAT optional schools? Okay. I'll be happy to take this one. Uh, so recently, uh, we've seen a lot of schools go SAT optional. And by that, they genuinely mean SAT optional. It's not like one of those strict questions where they say, you know, when you're applying for something and they say, oh, there's an optional question you can answer, but it's, I mean, you have to answer it. This isn't like that. If you choose not to take the SAT, again, you're not at a disadvantage because again, you know, a lot of students test differently. Some students perform well in certain types of exams. Some students don't perform as well. Um, and without the SAT, there are still, again, ways for you to demonstrate your academic abilities, your academic achievements. And if you're doing a course like the IBDP, where even like the math AI course is considerably challenging. So you are able to show the same skills that you would if you were to take the SAT. Um, so even with SAT optional school, there's no compulsion to take it. My recommendation as a college counselor for the SAT is if you are applying to highly competitive schools, which means you're applying to the Ivy League or Ivy Plus schools. So like, you know, if you're looking at Stanford, MIT, UC Berkeley, UCLA, if you're looking at schools in that league, regardless of what your major is, I would encourage you to take the SAT. And by the way, all of those schools are now SAT optional. I would recommend you to take it just because the caliber of students you're uh, competing against, it's, they're all going to be though in that 40 plus IB bracket. So at that point, you know, if you have done really well on the SAT, that's just one more thing you can show the universities, right? That, hey, I did really well on my SAT as well. And they'll be able to see that in between all of the requirements of the IBDP, you still manage to take the SAT and do well. So it reflects really well. And the second time when I recommend taking it is if you're applying for a STEM degree. So if you're applying for engineering or pre-med or a STEM related degree, then I would recommend taking it. So whether the school is, you know, even if it's SAT optional, I recommend it. Uh, but otherwise, honestly, there's, there's no compulsion. Like Kiro said, there's a lot of ways in which you can still show a very strong profile through your essays, through your extracurricular activities, through, you know, leadership positions. So they do tend to look at your application very holistically. Yes, exactly. Uh, and Faisal, uh, um, regarding that question, is there like a favorite score that I should aim to towards uh, if I'm taking uh, uh, the SAT? So again, that'll, that'll <laughs> depend from like college to college. Uh, usually what's very helpful is to look at like the previous years, uh, the students who got accepted to that university, what the average SAT score was. And that's what you need to aim for. Like you want what that average score was. So if last year they said that our average SAT score was between 
1450 to 1510, that's what you need to aim for. So in terms of giving an exact number, that's difficult because it depends on the college. But like definitely you're looking at 1400 and above if you're aiming for competitive schools. And honestly, 1500 and above if it's that like that top, you know, 1% of schools. Uh, but that being said, like I don't want to put any pressure on our students that have to get that SAT score, but that's just what colleges are going to be accepting if you're going to be applying to that league of schools. Yes. Thank you, Faiza. Um, and now uh, we have the last couple of questions, and uh, I'll try my best to merge them to merge them into just one question. Uh, and it's it's regarding language certificates. Um, so, um, as we all know that IB is, I mean, it's it's an English degree. I mean, IB English is, is really uh, tough. So why uh, are there still universities that do require an English test? Is this a mandatory or not mandatory? Um, do I really need an English test? Because, I mean, the IB English degree is, is pretty tough. And the other part of the question is, all right, so when are language certificates necessary? I'll be happy to take this one. This is something that puzzles me as well when you've done such a demanding and rigorous like curriculum all in English. There still are certain students, uh, colleges that ask for an English language test, a proficiency test, be that IELTS, TOEFL or Duolingo. A lot of colleges accept Duolingo now. Um, sometimes it just it comes down to individual university policy. So there are a lot of universities that will wave it off for you. So if you've taken HL, language and literature, I think Ruchi touched upon this as well earlier, they themselves may wave it. Otherwise, you can always write to a university and request them. You can say like, you know, I've been studying in English for X number of years. I've been taking the IBDP. I do English at HL you know, may I request you to waive my English requirement. So it is possible that, you know, they may even say that it is a requirement, but if you write to them, they waive it off. A lot of the times, stu uh, colleges do keep it on. Um, it's more of like either formality, it could be even related to visa purposes. So sometimes in the UK, you need to take the IELTS, not because the college necessarily needs it, but the UK home office needs it. So there are those kind of technicalities as well. Uh, but I have seen personally that a lot of schools now are not asking for it for from IBDP students. At the most, what I recommend students to do is to take the Duolingo test. It's much easier. You can take it from home. So it's unlike the IELTS or the TOEFL where you actually have to go to a testing center in person. You can do the Duolingo test at home. It's significantly easier and you can send your scores directly to universities. So if it comes to a point where, you know, it is necessary, that's what I would recommend. It's much easier to get done. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, this is one of those questions where I just feel like it shouldn't be required, but it's just college policy sometimes. Yes. Um... So I hope that answers uh, the question why uh, why IBDP English uh, um, I mean is 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 necessary I mean why IB uh, why language certificates are necess necessary despite the uh, IB uh, English uh, degree um, which you do, do do you have any um, further insights to add on on those two questions um, No I think I think Faisa covered it all and. Uh... Again, it's university, uh, university policy. And I think as much as it's a rigorous curriculum, they said the IDHS, English, some universities required it. Like she said, you can just approach the university and ask them to waive it all. Yes. Yes, that's true. All right, everyone. Uh, that actually concludes our uh, webinar tonight. Uh, I hope that you've all had a pretty wonderful and fruitful um, webinar uh, that's full of information, uh, wonderful insights and tips and tricks. Um, and again, um, 
just be ready whenever this um, webinar will be uploaded uh, on our website and on YouTube so that you can watch it and check all the live questions again, all the uh, presentation. Um, and I've, uh, I've typed in um, the chat, the emails for uh, Rucha and Faiza. If you um, folks have any questions, feel free to send your questions there and we'll do our best to answer yours. Um, and if you have any general questions regarding anything, whether that's IBDP related AP, IGCC, um, college profiling, feel free to connect and stay with us and stay in touch uh, at our website, Send Now, um, at our Send Now website. Um, thanks all for joining today. Uh, that was really helpful. And uh, I mean, thanks for joining on time. And um, we can't wait to see you all in the upcoming webinars. We have another webinar uh, coming in the 23rd uh, this month. Um, it's about profiling and the passion projects. So stay in touch because this is a really great and wonderful series. Um, so yeah, uh, thanks all. Thanks, Rucha and Faiza. And uh, I wish you all a wonderful night and uh, enjoy you. the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Take care. Bye. 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 Bye.